Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to another evening of Bible study. You know, it's so good to be here sharing a word with us. And we pray that, you know, the will of God be done tonight. Amen. Be sure you don't want to hear from a man, you want to hear from the Lord himself. And I just want to avail myself, you know, for the will of God to be done. Amen. Just bow your heads before we proceed tonight. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks tonight for your love, for your mercies. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to be here to share our word. We thank you for this gathering on this medium. We pray, mighty God, that you speak to every heart tonight. Lord Jesus, that the words as they go forth, God, they will go forth with anointing and with power, and they will accomplish that which you would have them to. We pray, mighty God, tonight that when all is said and done, that you be glorified and you be lifted up. Mighty God, we ask you to take charge of this Bible study and we ask you to bind every force of darkness that is trying to work against this study tonight. Let your will be done tonight. In Jesus' name. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome. And, you know, it's good to be here, you know, alive and, you know, being able to share a word with us. Tonight, I would like to look on a simple topic that is, and we can go to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, from 17 through to 28. And I would like to look at the topic tonight, the rejected and the accepted kings. So let us look at what 1 Samuel 15, verse 17 has to say to us. And Samuel said, when thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoils, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Had the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And thy words, because I fear the people, and obey their voice. Now therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, and if we should have a key verse, you know, this would be it. Verse 26. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord had rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold on the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine, 
that is better than dough. Amen. So, there we have it. Verse 26 would be our real key verse. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord had rejected thee from being king over Israel. So we like to just look a little bit at the rejected and the accepted kings, and from the readings we, and we are understanding of what the scripture says, you know, here about King Saul. But as we get down in the lesson, and in a couple of weeks coming, as we go down in the lesson, you are going to realize some of the things that Saul did. And you are going to realize some of the things that David did. And one was accepted, and the other was rejected. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let us look at the aim tonight. The aim of this study is really to look at the life of these two kings and to see how they can help us in our walk with the Lord. You know, we, I believe that there is a lot that we can learn as we look through the lives of these kings and how they deal with the situation as it presents the, itself, how they deal with the things of God. And as we look through it, you're going to see a difference. And I hope that as we go through the lesson, that we will be able to know, take things and apply to our lives and, and understand that in this day and age, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I like us to, as we go through, to see how we can, you know, get some things from, you know, the lives of these two kings to be able to help us in our walk with God. Then secondly, it is to help us to have a determination to live for God. We, you know, as we look at this, the life of Saul, Saul wasn't like what we read here in 1 Samuel chapter 15 when Saul started out. And if you look at the words of Samuel to, to Saul, he said, when thou was young, you became ruler over your tribe. And the Bible says that after two years, Saul changed what happened why he changed and we are going to inspect it we are going to dive down in it and see you know what the bible says to us but i would like us the, to be able from this lesson right to to have a determination to live for god because saul started out well but then something happened and he became selfish he became not as it were, following the command of God. What happened? And we are going to dive down in it and we are going to look at it. And then thirdly, if we are not so much on a good footing to motivate us to get on the path that, the, that is pleasing to the Lord. So as we go through this lesson now, your, might, your, your foot might not be so strong you know, in your relationship, in your walk with God. I hope that as we get through this study, that you will be at a point where your foot will be sown again, your walk will be sown again, and you will be able to, you know, be motivated to be on the path and to stay on the path that, you know, you will hear, well done, do good and faithful servant. So, introduction, when we look through history, of the kings of Israel, we will find that, you know, two of the most prominent kings are King Saul and King David. When we go through scriptures, you're going to recognize that the Bible spent a lot of time, you know, there were many other kings. You know, when the kingdom was di divided, there were many other kings that the Bible made mention of. But you'll find that a, a majority of the scripture in First and Second Samuel talk about the life of King Saul and the life of David. And, you know, we can learn a lot by looking at their lives, right? King Saul and King David. Um, we can learn a lot by looking at their life. What was different between the, these two men? 
What was different between them? Both kings were called and anointed by God. And you can look at 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, and 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. So in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, Saul anointed Samuel. And immediately after he anointed Samuel, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samuel. Upon Saul, sorry. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, he anointed David. This was after Saul was rejected. Samuel anointed David and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. So both kings were called and they were anointed by God. Both kings had the same privilege in that the privilege that King David had was the same privilege that Saul had. Both sin against God. Saul failed to obey the Lord in his commandment and David committed adultery. So, so we remember that about David. Anything we remember about David was that he committed adultery, but there are other things that he did. But Saul disobeyed the commandment of God. Yet, one was rejected, and the other was rejected. Why was one rejected? Is it that God is partial? Why was one rejected and the other accepted? Is it that God is partial in that he rejected King Saul? And then he referred to David as a man after his own heart. So as we look at the lives of these two men, we, 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 we can't help but to ask the question, what happened? Why was one rejected and the other accepted? When we look at Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. For the Lord is, your, is a God of gods and the Lord of lords. The great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial, nor does he take bribe. So we ask the question, is God partial? That if, that if that is the reason why he rejected Saul. And accepted David, but we know from the Bible that God is not partial. Amen. He's not partial, none at all. And the Bible in Deuteronomy tells us that God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awesome God. What a God who is not partial, nor does not take bribes. So you can't say to God, say, God, look here. Hola, monia. God, I'm going to do this. And you bypass Marangduin. God does not take bribes. The Bible also in the book of Acts 10, verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now truly understand that God does not show favoritism. So this was now when Cornelius was Cornelius and his household received the Holy Ghost. So now the, the Jews had received the Holy Ghost. But this was the first now that the Holy Spirit was being poured out on the Gentiles. And Peter said, look here, now I truly understand that God does not show favoritism. So, like we said, that both men had the same privilege. But why was one accepted and the other rejected? Then we can look at Romans chapter 2. Verse 11, for there is no respect of person with God. So whether you have money, whether you have doctorate, God don't respect persons. The same respect that God give me is the same respect that God give you. The same privilege that God give you is the same privilege that he give, give me. So when we look now at Saul and David, when you look at the overall picture, we get an understanding that it must have been something because both men sinned. It must have been something that Saul did. 
why the Lord rejected him. The scripture tells us that the Lord is not partial to what happened in their lives. That the Lord said unto Samuel, it repented me that I made Saul king over my people. But for David, he said, He's a man after my own heart. And he will do all that I commanded him to do. So the question, the real question is, what happened in their life so that King Saul was rejected? And David was accepted. For David, he said, he's a man after my own heart. God is not partial. But it was how both men approached their godly affairs. Saul approached the godly affair like it is just another affair. And like I said earlier on, that he started out well. And you're going to see the type of man that he was when he started out. But then something happened after two years, the Bible said. And the man just changed. The man became selfish, he became arrogant, disobedient to the commandment of God, and the list goes on. But David walked according to the words of the Lord and had a repented heart. But Saul would not ha accept his deeds when it was pointed out to Saul that, look here, this is what you did. Saul blamed the people, and we're going to get into all of it, and we're going to talk. Saul would not walk according to the command of the Lord. And the Lord rejected him. I would also like us to know tonight that God changes not. The Lord does not change. He is unchangeable. He is an unchangeable. He, he is immutable. And just as all way back then. Saul wanted, after a time, to do his own thing. Would not accept responsibility for his doing. Blame the people. And God rejected him. I would like us to understand tonight that God is immutable. And if we walk any way like how Saul walk, today God will reject us. But Elder, God loved me. He, he, he sent his son to die on the cross for me. It is a different dispensation. So would God in this dispensation, after he sent his son to shed his blood, will he reject me in this day and age? Brethren, you would be surprised. And the scripture says it, and you have it there. God is immutable. He changes not. And just as how he rejected Saul, God is not afraid to reject any one of us if we walk contrary according to it. His arms are open and he's ready to grant repentance. But if we walk according to our own will and sin presumptuously, I can guarantee you that God will reject us just like how we rejected Saul. Just as how we rejected King Saul for being disobedient and walking contrary to his word. So it is that in today's time, God will reject us if we walk in disobedience of his word. But on the contrary, if we walk and have a godly reverence, a godly respect, and walk according to his will, just as we commended David and said, look here, David is a man after my own heart. He will do the same with us today. So he changes not, and he's a just God. And 
Saul walked contrary according to his word and according to his command, and God rejected him. And I'm saying to us tonight that if we walk contrary according to the command of God, God is going to reject us. But on the other hand, he said about David before Saul even anointed him that this is a man that will do all that I commanded him to do. And I want to tell us tonight that if we get to the point where we are willing to do all that God commanded us to do, God will say to us, this is somebody after my own heart. This is a person who will follow my every command. We will hear at the end of the day, well done, though good and faithful servant. But we have to walk according to the will of God. We have to walk according to the command of God. And I want us to, to catch this point tonight that God is immutable. He does not change. If we walk according to his will, you will hear commendation. But if we walk not according to his command, God will reject us. So how it all began. Let us look now at 1 Samuel chapter 8. Because the Saul, the prophet, was old. And the scripture is going to tell us. Sorry, Samuel, the prophet, was old. And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abiah. And they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after Luca, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Saul unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. I want us to know that part, you know. Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and serve other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore, hearken unto their voice, how be it yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons. Now listen to this carefully, you know. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. He will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties. And he will set them to, his, to hear his groan and to reap his harvest and to make his instrument of war 
an instrument of chariots. And he will take her daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, the best of them, and give them to his servant. And he will take your men servants and he will take the tent of your seed of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your, and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tent of your sheep and he shall be his servants. And they shall cry out in that day because of your king, which he, have, which he shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. We'll come back to the scripture. But let us just go back to the slide a little bit. So, Samuel, like we said, was old. And his son took bribes. And the people asked for a king. The Lord told Samuel to hearken unto them, but protest solemnly. And Samuel was displeased. But when he went to the Lord, the Lord said, Hearken unto them, man. They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. The Lord then instructed Samuel, you know, instructed him. He said, hearken but protest. Give them reason why they should not choose a king. And he said, this is the manner of the king that shall reign over you. So let us look at the manner of the king. He said, she will take your sons. I was pointing it out, you know. She will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, for his horsemen, and some shall be run before his chariots. So when the chariots was going forward with the horses, some of these sons that the king took, would have to run before the chariots. Now think about you having a son. Because sometimes we read the story and we read it afar off. Now think about you having a son. Think about you being a part of Israel at that time. And you have a son. Would you be willing to give up your son? To run before the chariot? To probably show the king is coming. He will appoint your son's captain and make his instrument of war. Well, probably you, you, you wouldn't mind having your son a soldier. But you still would be worrying because if your son go to war, he might not come back. Right? And then he will take your daughters to be confectioners and to be cooks and to be bakers. No, no, listen to this one. Imagine that you have a field. And you spend all of your days working that field. You plow it, you plant it, and it looks good. It is bringing forth fruit. And the Lord said through Samuel, 
He will take your fields. He will take your vineyards. He will take your olive yards. Even the best of them. The king not going to take the worst, you know. He will take the best of them. And he will give them to his servants. Now this, these servants are the servants who please the king well, you know. He probably might be a strong warrior. Or a good warrior. He said, look here. The vineyard are your one. The king not owned the vineyard, you know, but the king now had the, the, the power to take the vineyard and to give to his servants. He will take your men servants and your maid servants. He will take the tent of your seed and of your vineyard and give to his officers and to his servants. He will take your men servants, your maid servants, and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. So if the king happened to be walking one day and see you have a nice stallion, he can say, look here, take that, take that stallion there. You have a good servant taking care of the stallion. Take a servant there too. They are mine now. He will take the tent of your sheep. And he shall be his servants. Samuel said... You shall cry out, you know, so the man of the king, Samuel was saying to the people, it, you're going to cry out. And when you cry, the Lord will not hear. I would be so fearful, or I think that if I was there, I would be so fearful to say, boy, when you cry, God not going to hear me. Me no want that king of them. But despite Samuel's protest, protest, the people refused and requested a king. What could, what could have been in the heart of the people so that even when the Lord protests, the people say, away with you and give us a king? In spite of all that Samuel said, the people said, give us a king. You, you can imagine. The man of the king will make you cry. And when you cry, the Lord will not hear. But the people say, give us a king. The people were, was, were willing to give up all that they were told that they would have to give up. To please the king, the people were willing to give up all of that just so that they can have a king. I would like to tell us, I would like to make my next point here. What we ask for will tell us where our heart is. What we ask will tell where our heart is. The things we ask for will tell where our heart is. Israel asking for a king to replace God spoke volume to him. It was God that brought them out of Egypt. It was God that gave them the victory over the nations around them. But yet the people reached the point where they said, we, we, we are away with you. Give us an earthly king. We want an earthly king. So Israel asked him for a king to replace God's poor volume to him. It said to God, it says to God that the people whom he brought out, the people whom he selected, the people whom he have given so much to 
were, was now at the point where they are saying, God, I'll be with you and give us somebody that we can see. Do you know what it is like to be rejected? Have somebody ever rejected you? So imagine God who had invested so much in these people. They came to the point where they said, God, away with you. We need somebody that we can see. The Lord said, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. The same is true with us. We might not say, God, away with you. We might not say, God, we want to replace you. But our actions and what we ask for says it. Oh, Jesus. What do I mean by this? If we find ourselves asking only for earthly gifts, then something is wrong. Let me repeat that. If we find ourselves when we go before God, when we go in communion with God, and all we can ask for is earthly things, then something is wrong. And we need to check ourselves. We need to check where we are with God. Yes, I understand. Sometimes we need to give ourselves some good treats. We need to give ourselves some good treats. So that we can better serve others. So if we pray and we say, God, give us a big house. You know, we can invite over some persons. We can cook some food. Give me some money. We can help some people. Right? I'm not saying anything wrong with that, you know. But if we find that when we go down, the only thing that we can pray for and ask God for are these streets, then something is wrong. By me, no means am I saying that anything is wrong with praying for a house. No, nothing is wrong with praying for a house. As a matter of fact, it's a good thing to pray for a house because any ambitious person would desire a house. And, and nothing is wrong with praying for a car. Nothing is wrong with praying for land. And, and Lord, give me a business or give me a good job, give me promotion. Nothing is wrong with praying for these things. However, if we find ourselves when we go down, The only thing we ask for are these earthly gifts. Then I put it to you, church, that something is wrong. And we need to check ourselves. What you ask for tells where your heart is. So if my heart is like a child, if, if, if you, a child will come to you when he desires certain things and he say, look here, Give me this thing, Daddy. I remember years ago when my eldest son was, was much younger. Ever so often we have to be purchasing drumsticks. Daddy, we need drumsticks. There were nights, there were nights when I was going to bed. All I can hear in the room is boodoodoom, 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 boodoodoom. The, the young man was practicing. All that was on his heart was, was playing the drum. So a child, when he desires certain things, that is what he will ask for. When you ask for certain things, it tells where your heart is. So if you find yourself going before God, and all that you are asking for is earthly things. It says to God where your heart is. You might not be saying to God, God, away with you. Because you're not going to go before God and say that. But really, when you ask for the things, 
<laughs> the Lord must be saying, but all Brother Billy can ask for is a job. All Brother Billy can ask for is amigos. What about the things that pertain to me? So when you look at the big picture in a man, it, tell you, it tells you where Israel was. So Samuel was old and his son pervert, his sons perverted justice. And his son took bribes. So, so, so because of the son's doing, so to speak, they never had that kind of person there that, would, that would, was willing to hold up the mantle and said, look here, this is where we, we're going. We're serving God. The people heart. when you look at the request, you understand that the people's heart was far from the Lord. So nothing is wrong with asking for earthly gifts. But when we go before God, and this is what we're asking for, only this alone we're asking for, then we understand that something is extremely wrong. I know that the Bible says, that not all the time we will be able to pray as we are to pray. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, talks about the divine helper who makes intercession for us. Now, now I want us to, to listen to this. So there are times that we don't know what to pray for, you know. And the Spirit will make intercession for us. So listen to what the, the apostle said. And in like manner, the Spirit also help our infirmities. So I want you to understand now what the scripture is saying. Look here, because you desire that early thing, so much early things. And all that you go before God with is the early things. The Spirit now have to intervene. And make intercession, for we know not how to pray as we are to. The Bible is saying that we don't know. So, so I know that the Bible is saying this to us, you know. You don't know what to pray for as you are to. But the Spirit himself make it intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts, O oh glory, knoweth the mind of the Spirit. Because she make it intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit will make intercession for us. But when we're not praying in the Spirit, when the Spirit is not making intercession for us, what is it that we ask God for? I put it to us tonight that, and we all know that when we pray, we should pray with certain understanding. I am not here to, 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 to go down in prayer. I am just going as the Lord had, had burdened me as I prepare myself. Because what the Lord is saying to us, oh God, is that we are praying so much for the earthly things and the things that bear more weight is not being prayed for they are neglected nothing is wrong with us wanting a sanctuary and praying for a sanctuary fasting for a sanctuary but we must also put the weight of things before God first the sanctuary is not the weightier thing, you know. Because the, 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 the wise man said, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So if we, when we get that place and we fix it up, we have a beautiful place to come and worship God. When the rapture comes, we're in a different place.
So what is it that we should ask for? The thing that they asked for, the, the thing that they asked for was the thing that they desired. They desire an earthly king, and that is what they went to God and asked for. It is similar to us. The things that we ask for tells where we are with God. So if we go before God and we say, God, house and care and husband, wife and... Look here. It is saying to God where your heart is. The temporal things are a part of the things that we should ask for. Yes. But we must know how to strike a balance. They asked for a king and in doing so, they rejected God. I believe that as Christians and as people of God, we are supposed to be careful what we ask for. So what are some of the things that we we'll ask for? I would suggest that we ask for spiritual growth. It is God's will that we all mature and become more like Jesus every day as we walk. We have a great responsibility in relation to our spiritual growth. There are some things that we must do. We must pray. We must fast. We must read the word of God. Take time out to digest the word of God. However, we cannot do it on our own. So asking God's help for spiritual growth is of utmost importance. Asking God's help for spiritual growth will help you become the type of mature Christian that God wants you to be. The thing that you ask for sure shows where your heart is. And I would rather to go before God and say, God, look here. Strengthen me. I never go in fasting yet, and that is not on my prayer list. God, I understand that I'm weak. Just one thing I can sleep up. Lord, help me to grow in maturity. I'm telling you about the more weightier things, you know. Because the children of Israel, they focus on the physical. And they look around us and they saw what the other nations were doing. And we're going to get there. But it pushed them to ask, Almighty oh, God. And we as the people of God, we are looking around. And we see how many young, so much young persons driving the, the biggest vehicles. And they're having the, 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 the most expensive apartment. And it, it you know, brings us to the point as Christians. We say, Lord, these are the things that we want. And I am not saying anything is wrong with that. But where does our priority lies? And what do we place the most weight I would rather to ask for, oh Lord Jesus, and I'm trying, to, uh, let, let me be myself. You see what I'm telling you here is what I do. Like I say, I never go down before God and don't ask for spiritual strength, especially when I'm fasting. From I'm fasting, it happened upon number one for my list. Lord, help me to grow in maturity. Then, we should ask God for help us to walk in the Spirit's power. The Bible says that as many that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. And this is what we should ask for. I can serve Jesus with all my heart and with all my strength. If I walk in the Spirit's power, the Holy Spirit will effectively sanctify the follower of Jesus Christ so that we can be holy 
and be useful for all he asks us to do. So, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord. And without the spirit of God, we are none of his. So the more we ask God, say, God, help me to decrease. And help the spirit to increase. We might be able to walk in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Then I would like to encourage us to ask for an effective ministry. Oh, glory to God. What is it that God has called you to do? I would like to put it to us that God has not called any of us to one bench in the church. What is it that God called you to do? Are you in the position that you should be in? Are you working in the ministry that God called you to work in? When you are doing what God asks you to do, it is appropriate to continually ask God to help us to be the best that we can be in the ministry. God has given us a ministry, but are we effective? Are we settled where we are at? Or is there more that we can achieve? You see, just as how you strive to be the best in a class, or the best on the work floor, so that you can be acknowledged, I believe that is the type of attitude that we should have as it pertains to ministry. Ask God for effective ministry. Oh, hallelujah. Then, the next thing that we can ask for, Lord, help us to love. We are called to love those around us. Honestly, it is not e easy to do. And we have heard the statement before, some people is hard to love. Because of the things that they do. But when God looked down at us and knew that we were sinners, he still sent his son. If we love each other, this is how we, it is known that we are his disciples. Asking him to help us to love fully is appropriate. We can't do it of our own, you know. Because for some of us, we find it so hard to get over the hatred in our hearts for others. But we can't do it on our own, so it's appropriate to ask God to help us to love. The Bible in St. John 13, 34, a new commandment Jesus said, I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. So, if we're going to ask God for anything, yes, the, the, the earthly things are good. We will live in on the earth and we want to have them. But there are some more weightier things, like the salvation of souls. When we go down to pray, do we, do we, do we look at you know, our unsaved relatives? Do we look out at our unsaved neighbors? Do we look at the souls that we pass daily in our communities? Do we pray that prayer adventure, God will have mercy and, 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 and save one of these souls? 
So, so we on the point, you know, the, the things that we asked for shows what is in our heart and shows where our heart is, shows where our allegiance is. Because if we ask for early things more than these things, you go down for one week to pray. Sometimes, sometimes the, the burden is on, on me so much. It's when I go down to pray, and we can't pray about our ministry. We can't pray about nothing else. So, but we pray for salvation of souls. What about our unsaved relatives? Remember, you know, the Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? And what shall he give in exchange or glory for his soul? So the, 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 the wealth of this world, if you accumulate the wealth of this world, it is not enough to pay for one soul. And I believe that as the church, we should get the burden, start praying for the burden as individuals, that God help me. To say something to our soul. God touch that person that I'm a past today. When we look at the, the, the amount of persons now, mighty God, that, that is on the roadside, it seems like you have more unso people of unsown mind now than ever before. You, you know, concerns that these are souls. Oh, geez. Sometimes I wish I could just come out of my vehicle and just speak a word and the person just get back into them right mind. Look here. I believe. Oh, God. I, you see these people? Probably if the church was at a point that we can offer some help and rehabilitate them. Probably is one of the, the best soul winners that, you know. You just don't know. But, but we just, we don't have a burden for still look here that, that, that person that will pass out a leading edge, that lady that will pass out a leading edge almost every day. Just sit down, rain come and she dear, sun come and she dear. Oh God, touch our soul, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. How many unsaved person know that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. We have to pray that God will open the door and save souls. This is why we are a part of the church. Not just to one bench. We are not here to one bench, sorry. But we are there to participate in the winning of souls. Then if we ask God for anything, again, it should be healing for everyone that you know is sick. And sometimes we might get discouraged because we pray and we believe God for healing and we don't see any healing. But, but remember, you know, it is God that is still in control. And God knows who is him ready to take from whom don't ready to take. He knows who is going to give time to prepare themselves so that when they pass off they can be with him because at the end of the day you know the, the him is to be with god but we still have to pray for healing if we, we pray and we lay hands and we still don't see the thing happen like oh we want it to happen we still need to pray and we still need to believe god what about wisdom we need all the wisdom we can get in this time to deal with the life decisions, to deal with the relationship issues, to deal with the difficult circumstances that we, feel at, we, we face at work. We need wisdom to deal with all of these things. James 1 verse 5, he said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Ask for wisdom, man. 
Ask for wisdom. And let God give you wisdom. Hallelujah. You think it, in this day and age when you have so much, so much scammers and so much persons that, that, that set up to the trick, you need wisdom to deal with some of these things, you know? So if you lack wisdom, ask God, give him wisdom to deal with affairs. I know healing. I know healing is a part of the is a part of spiritual gifts. But look here, prayer man for spiritual gifts. Prayer for spiritual gifts. Lord, manifest the gifts in the church. Lord, if there is any hindrances to the to the gifts manifesting in the house, remove the hindrances. But pray for spiritual gift and remove any endurances preventing it. Lord, if unity, the lack, unity is lacking, God, let there be unity in the church. Remove the ism and schism so that the anointing can flow from the head right down to the least of us. What you ask for tells where your heart is. I would encourage us today. We want to get into the life of Saul and the life of David. But as I travel the path to get to dealing with Saul first, this is where the Lord is leading my heart. And I just come and just talking to us as the Lord is leading me. The Lord is saying to us tonight that we need to ask for the weightier things. This is how Jesus said that we are to pray. Matthew 9, 6 to 13. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we talk about the kingdom of God first. And we talk about the things of God. Then now we come to the point where we say, give us this day our daily bread. And Jesus said, we have to do it, you know. So I am saying to us that if we find ourselves, the things we ask for, tells where our heart is. If we find ourselves, when we go before God, the only things that we ask for is to get an increase at work. And every day you go before God, you spend a majority of the time asking about an increase at work. And don't even remember to ask for the gifts. Don't even remember to ask to help you to win a soul, to help you to reach a soul. Then you're not dealing with the weightier things. And I will tell us, brethren, that if we present the weightier things before God, it will show the Lord where our heart is. And the Lord will see that, oh God, your heart is in a place and the Lord will bless you. David was one of the kings that was, was, was blessed, so to speak, than all of the other kings. You know why? Because his heart was on the things of God. God just opened up doors. Because his heart was on the things of God. When it was not, was not even his responsibility, David said, look here, I want to build God a temple. It no must be somebody that, that, whose heart is on God. He can say, God, I want to build you one temple. And God have to say, uh, your son is going to build it, man, because your heart... Your hands are bloody. So your son going to build it. But Jesus gave us the formula. Jesus said, look here. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. He said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then you start praying over the things pertaining to yourself. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me the house. Give me the car. Give me this. But you talk about the more weightier things first, which are the things of the house of God. 
I put it first tonight, Bridget. If we have not been praying this way, we need to get to the point where we're praying this way because the things that we ask for tells where our heart is. I want it to, to be where God said, look here, I mean, know where Brother Bailey's heart is because he, he asks for the things that are more weightier. Amen, somebody. So if we, I know I'm reaching somebody, I feel it, you know, because you know, the Lord just put it in my spirit and, oh God. So let us now go back to the scripture, um, 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we will go now to verse 20. So, Samuel protested. God instructed to Samuel protest. And he, he protested. And the people said, in spite of what you say, we want a king. God was the one that go before them in battles. God was the one that was fighting their battles. <laughs> but the people say that they wanted a king, a physical king that they could see. I don't want to be too critical because probably if I was there, don't taste the Holy Spirit like when I taste it. No, probably I would have been saying the same thing like them. But look at verse 20 now. So they asked for a king. And this is the reason why they asked for the king. Verse 20. That we may also be like all the nations. You can imagine. And that our king may judge us and go before us and fight our battle. But God was doing all of this. God was their king. He was going before them. He was fighting their battles. Sometimes they don't even have to lift a straw. And God give them the victory. Brethren, it's a serious thing this, you know. Be because the people see with their own eyes. And they heard it from their four parents. How God brought them the victory. But the people say, give us a king that we may be like all the nations. This was the very thing the Lord commanded them against. This was the very thing that the Lord commanded them against. Verse 20, they, that we may also be like all the nations, that our, king, that our king may judge us and go before us and fight our battle. God was their king. He went before them and fight their battles, but they wanted a physical king. They wanted a king to be like the other nations. And this was the very thing the Lord commanded them against. Leviticus chapter 18, verses 2 to 4. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. Your
you must not do as they do in Egypt. Wherein he dwelt, shall he not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall he not do. Neither shall he walk in their ordinances. This was the very set of people, you know, that it was said to them, write it upon the doorpost and upon the lintel. The Lord your God is one Lord. And all of the things that the Lord instructed them to do was passed down. But here it is that we're reading that the people say, give us a king that we might be like the other nations. But when we read back in Leviticus, the Lord was saying to them, Egypt that I brought you from, you shall not do like they did. And the land of Canaan that I know bring you into, you shall not do what you see the nations around you doing. God was clear. So later, later in Leviticus 19, verse 2, he said, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. This was God talking to his people, you know, and they understood what he was saying. They wanted a king to be like the other nation, but God wanted them to be different. God wanted them to be different. The pagan nations around them worship many gods. And were known for promiscuity, dishonest business practice, and such the like. But Israel was called to be different. Don't do like the other nations. They worship many gods, but I want you to worship me, one God. Here, oh Israel, the Lord, our God, is one. They eat certain things, but I want you to be different. So don't eat the things that they eat. And God was careful to give them a list of the things that they should eat. God was careful. God went through lengths and breath so that the children of Israel could understand that they were different. They were called to be different. They were called to be separate and apart from the other nations around them. They should have been the example to the other nations. But they rejected the Lord and said, Lord, Give us a king that we can be like the other nations. You can imagine, it is like, it is like Bishop coming and teaching on certain things. Year after year after year, you talk about holiness. And the part of the church that Bishop come, not saying that this is happening, you know, just giving an example, would say, look here, you can talk about holiness, but men are not live holy. Really, that was happening, you know, because God talked about it, it went through length and breadth. And the people said, we want to be like the other nations. This applies to the church as well, you know. Yes, this applies to the church as well today. 
I want us to know that we are a special people, a special call out set of people. And God wants us to be different. He wants us to understand that we are a special people, a special set of people. And he called us out. He, he called us by his name. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. We are special. Peter said. We are a special set of people. He said. Be ye, but ye are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people that he should show for the praise of him who had called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So God calls us. God calls us to be separate. God calls us to be separate. He calls us to be different from the world. We live in a society that is perverse. I recognize that the ladies, they are wearing little or nothing on the road. And you, you, you don't want to be working night shift. Or leave work like 10 o'clock and, and probably have to pass a party. They're almost naked on the road. People are ungodly. When we look around us, if we are not aware, we should recognize that the spirit of the Antichrist precedes him. The Bible said that he will have no need for a woman which tells us the type of man he will be. We have seen an increase in violence. And the type of world that we are living in, we must be different because God commands it. We must be different. God calls us to be separate. God calls us to be separate. He calls us to be different from the world. It pains my heart to see People in church, people who are born again, receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Just like Israel. They are saying to God, give us the world. Give us the things of the world. They are saying to God, give us the things of the world. But God calls us to be separate. He calls us to be different from the world. Ephesians 4 verses 17. The, the, the Bible says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. And this Gentile is used here, is not... Anybody other than the Jews is Gentiles. And, and, and the apostle is saying, look here, the thinking. The thinking. So that is why he also said in another scripture that we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind.
So we live in a society that is trying to dictate to the church. But the church cannot take any dictation from the world. Light and darkness have no fellowship. A candle when it's put on a stand cannot be hid. The church at no time should try to be like the world. I tell you, you know, I, I, I go through the scripture and this is the burden that the Lord gives me. I'm just sharing it with us. The church at no time should be like the world. Not in our dressing. If you follow folks, they don't want to wear anything come to church. They watch so much YouTube and they watch so much TikTok and all of them something there. And the same type of thing they want to bring to church. So at no time should the church look like the world, not in our dressing. Not in our speech. As, as, as people of God, we tend to pick up the slangs of the world. But why? At no time should we try to entertain ourselves like how the world entertains itself. The church must be easily identified. The church must be easily identified. The church must be easily identified. The Lord commands us to be like himself, separate, holy, and righteous. It pains my heart, virgin. To see, we get in the teachings. We know God is in our midst. But just like the children of Israel, folks among us, eyes are blinded. And they are saying, give us a king so that we might be like the world. Young people, I talk to you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. You're young. And I understand that you want to experience it for yourself. But I also, under God, want you to know that instead of experiencing certain things for yourself, take the telling from those who have experienced it already and tell yourself, don't go there. So if my come and tell you, say, shark is in the sea bottom, you want to go down there and see shark down there too? Hallelujah. Young people, I talk to you in the name of the Lord. You might not understand why your parents are telling you certain things. But later on, you will understand it. Later on, you will understand. And you will probably be telling your children the same thing. But your parents telling you certain things because they have your best interest at heart. Your parents telling you not to watch certain things because they have your best interest at heart. They're telling you not to spend so much time on, on TikTok because they have your best interest at heart. So you can't be in the church and want to be like the world or be in the world at the same time. The Bible says no man cannot serve two masters. Serve God, man. Serve God. 
It was so much of a struggle to prepare myself and come and do Bible study. You know that minister sat in for me last week. Oh God, I, I felt so bad. I asked minister to sit in for me last week. And today I was coming home and, you know, I felt, I felt so bad yesterday. And today I was coming home and Mr. God may wish me young again. Because I just give you everything from that time there. You know, I'm still making my mind say, God, what I have now, I still go and give it to you. But look here. You young man, I call up on you, but you have the strength on your side. You know, it's no, you forgive God everything now, you know. And not because I say young man, young man, ladies too. Right? But the church must be easily identified. The church must be easily identified. The Lord commands us to be like himself, to be separate, holy, and righteous. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 to 18. He said, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, say the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you. And he shall be my sons and my daughters, say the Lord. He said, come out from among them. If you don't come out from among them, I can't say to you, you are my son or you are my daughter. You have to first come out from among them. The children of Israel asked for a king. And the reason why they asked for a king was to be like the other nation. I am saying to us tonight, People of God, you have enough in the house of God. You have seen God work in your life. Satisfy with God. If you don't get it, it is because God don't want you to have it. The church must be separate. And I want to leave us with this tonight. That we come to the point where we understand that God calls us to be an example to the world. We cannot be like the world and think that we are setting an example. We're not setting an example. The, the, the children of Israel had a king. King of all kings they have. That was leading them, guiding them, fighting their battles for him. And they said, God, we want a physical one away with you. Verse 21 of verse 21 of First Samuel chapter 8. Just wrap up right now. And Samuel heard the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the people of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. God gave them a king, one with the heart that was selfish, a heart that was unwilling to do what the Lord commanded him to do, a heart that was not willing to take responsibilities for his action, a heart that had no respect for the anointed of God. They asked for a king, and God gave them the type of king that they desire. The first king that they desired was a king that represented the people. He, rep he represented the ways of the people. And they asked for a king, and God gave them a king. But the second king was a king that God selected, and God gave them. And we are going to come back next week, God's willing. And we are going to 
look at the life of Saul. And we are going to look at some of the things that God commanded him to do. And what he failed to do. We are going to look at how he started out. And look at what changed. But God, they asked for a king to be like the nations. And God gave them a king after their own heart. Every type of behavior that this king did was a representation of the heart of the people that cried for him. God bless you today. I hope you were encouraged. I pray that you would have learned something and that you would have been persuaded in your mind that you are going to do your very best to serve the Lord. As we close, let me just close off in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Holy God, for what was said tonight. We know that you have spoken, that your words have gone forth, and that hearts are being touched. We pray that you'll bring souls to repentance. We pray, mighty God, that you'll bring us to the point where we are completely surrendered to you and where we are willing to, to do all that you command us to do. We ask that you help us to not desire the things of the world, but the de desire the things that are spiritual, desire the things that, almighty God, are more weightier and that we will come to you and these are the things that we will talk to you about. We ask God that you will have your way in us and that you will keep us and let your will be done tonight as we give you glory and honor. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So by way of announcement, as we close off, there will be men's group retreat this Saturday. Amen. The bus leaves at 29 Lindale Avenue at 8 a.m. Our men's group president said last Sunday at church that you don't need to worry about any money. Just show up. Right? So try and reach by 7.30 so we can pray, organize yourself, and then we'll just leave. Right? Secondly, <clears throat> uh, we encourage all our men to turn out and let us have a day of food, fun, and fellowship. Minister said you don't need to worry about food. As a matter of fact, he says that you're supposed to carry a dish so that you can take back food for your wife. God bless you. In the name of the Lord. All be well. We come back next week and we continue in Jesus' name. Amen.